So the, the very first and most important thing that, um, that I wanted to mention in, um, in what I share with you today is that you know, we've been watching in the technology area and in IBM uh, specifically a number of big transformational shifts that are happening in the marketplace. Uh, the first would be a shift around data, um, and, and our CEO would, would say it's becoming what oil was to the way it changed industry in the world, um, and it is going to have dramatic effects uh, in the future. Um, so we're going to talk a bit about data and what's changing around data. Um, we have seen as well the ability for us to have incredible amounts of computing capacity or capability made available through the cloud. And what the cloud really means if you boil it down is people who have a great idea and are starting to build a solution can very easily get access to big computing infrastructure. And, and they can do it with a credit card and a click on a website. And that's increase the speed and delivery of solutions into the marketplace tremendously from what we experienced 20 years ago. So that cloud opportunity and that high computing capability has really been transformational. I'm going to tie that in later on to uh, what we're seeing. Mobility is unbelievable right now in its ability to be able to affect interactions with people and deliver compute capability as well. And when you hear the word mobility, in, in my jargon, what we're talking about is we're, we're, we're pretty well talking about the mobile handsets that are ubiquitous now. Everybody has a smartphone. And smartphones today have more computing capacity and greater memory to store things on them than what was used in the Apollo mission to put our astronauts on the moon. So we've got this great now this great technology that everybody has in their hands. So developers say, wow, this is great. Now we can start to build solutions, apps or applications that can do many, many things with those smartphones. So mobility has really changed the, the customer engagement, so patient engagement, and it's changed the way we can collect information, and we'll talk a bit about that as well. And then the other big shift, of course, and that's the, the core points of the, uh, the, the conversation here, is around cognitive computing. And cognitive computing, uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit and try to share with you, you know, the different types of cognitive computing that exist. Uh, but cognitive computing really means the ability for us to now, with great tremendous speed, have computing systems be able to artificially act and reason like a human to be able to add artificial intelligence and augment the experience of a person. And to be able to do it in a very different way than a human model, in terms of accuracy, bias, and speed. So we're going to talk about those shifts. Uh, within Watson Health, so my division that I work for, we're trying to take all of these, these trends and changes that are happening right now in the industry and figure out how do we capitalize on them to do three things. How do we deliver better health for people? And how do we also have better experiences for those patients that are interacting with our caregivers or practitioners? And then at last, how do we get better value out of the scarce resources we have for our practitioners and the medical services that we have in the marketplace? So those are the three kind of underlying objectives that the, the Watson team would have as they look at building products. So I mentioned um, data. And, I'll, and I'll, I'll try to quickly take you through a little bit of an of a evolution here, a journey. Uh, if we look at the bottom right corner, you know, go back a couple of decades ago, and, and the things that our practitioners had available uh, to them to be able to diagnose and work with us on a health-related issue were quite limited. It, it, it turned out, you know, it's whatever clinical data was available. So this is, we've got some blood work, we've, uh, we've taken your blood pressure, we have, you know, some, some images that were taken, we have that amount of clinical data, but we don't know about you. So as we determine your health outcome, and as we work on determining what prognosis there is or what treatment, the, the data was quite limited. Uh, fast forward over the last uh, 10 years, and huge progress in the medical practice around being able to uh, look at genomics, and now be able to understand a little bit more about you and how it might affect your reaction to certain 
treatments, it might uh, affect your propensity to have certain diseases. And we've started to unlock some of those correlations in the genomics. So it used to be it would cost thousands of dollars for us to run genomics tests. And now you can go on a website with your credit card and you can have a sequencing done to look at you know, what your hereditary background is and your culture. And with 1, 2, 3 and me and Harmony, you can also have genetic process or genetic sequencing done, and it's a hundred dollars. So now you have a low-cost process to be able to do genetic screening and you have the ability to be able to use that data to make better determinations around what diseases you might likely react to or, or do you have a propensity for, what certain treatments might be better for you, you might, be, you might react better to. So all this data now is becoming available to clinicians and practitioners and it's huge in terms of its size. So now we've got probably a, a 40 percent of the view of, all, of the determinants that would help us with a diagnosis and treatment, <clears throat> but it doesn't end there. So with that now, in the, in the group of assets that are available to the doctors and the practitioners, we add what we're calling now the exogenous uh, determinants. And this is now the huge amount of other points of data that can be correlated or brought together to better understand a diagnosis or better predict an outcome for an individual. And now we have wearables with Fitbits, now we have implants that people put in. I can give you an illustration of, uh, of a big car manufacturer who, in Germany that is working and collaborating right now with monitors inside of the car that are not monitoring how the engine and how the vehicle is driving, but instead are monitoring how the passenger is doing. So we've got all this data, huge amounts of data. And, and so what we've got is we've got the perfect storm that happened in a good way. We've got all these developers, they know how to be able to very quickly build solutions through the cloud. <coughs> We've got ways to be able to collect and communicate the data back to the people and the practitioners through smartphones and through the cloud services. And we've got cognitive capabilities to be able to take all that data and add some intelligence to what we've been collecting, to look for certain correlations, patterns, or find the importance of what's in that data relative to that specific individual. So that's a big change for us in terms of um, assets that are available to the practitioners. I wanted, to, you know, I wanted to say it's, there's no end in sight. It's explosive right now in terms of what's happening with the data, the health-related data that we're able to collect. Uh, by 2020, uh, they, they say that the, uh, the footprint of medical data will, will be doubling in every 73 days. Uh, 60 billion medical images in 2015 in the United States alone. 60 billion. So if you took all the diagnostic radiologists that are in the United States, 31,000 of them, they'd have one second every day, every day of the year, to be able to review <laughs> and to be able to assess each of those images. So we're, we're overflowing with this data and, and, and now have very limited ways for us to be able to actually use it all as best we could. If we took the, the abstracts and publications from, from our great researchers and practitioners that are published to, to PubMed every year, we find there's 26 million of them that, 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 that come out annually. These are relative and, and relevant and important documents with research findings that are published. Now, if you, if you took all those and you printed them, the, the, the stack would be higher than Mount Fuji. So I, I don't know who, if I could find the individual that has the time and the capability to be able to read all those <laughs> and still be able to practice their, their trade, right? But now, we would need to have artificial intelligence. We would need to have cognitive computing. But we can't find those people that can, can assume and, and assimilate all that data into their day-to-day -day practice and capitalize on all of it and still be able to then do the important things of treating people. So we, this is what we're facing. We're facing. Um, we've, we've got a little bit of a dilemma. The, the clinicians, the practitioners, 
and our caregivers you know, absolutely need help. And there's no end in sight. You know, the IDC, great big firm, the, the, the global firm that, uh, that does a lot of research, uh, and published their, their, their chart, and they tried to position, you know, where are we on the curve? And it's like, oh my gosh, we're at the bottom of the hockey stick on, on what's coming. And it's coming from so many different sources that you, you, you couldn't have a human be aware of and, and deeply knowledgeable in each of the different areas that, that all this data is coming from. But if you figure out a way to take all that data and put it all together, you, you've, you've really got a powerful capability to do a much better job in delivering healthcare. So this is what drove then, this is my big lead up, this is what then drove the investments that were necessary to figure out, okay, how do we take all this great technology that we've got today and start to apply it to that problem? How do we have some cognitive capabilities? So, at IBM, we have what's called the, uh, the, the Grand Research Challenge. So the Grand Research Challenge, in, in our company, we spend a lot of money on, on, on research, billions of dollars on research, and uh, in Canada alone, here's the pitch for IBM, we will spend 500 million, about 480 to 500 million dollars a year in Canada research. So, so research is really important to the company, and as a private sector company, that's what fuels your, your viability and your ability to be able to deliver new solutions in the future. So we had this grand challenge, and the grand challenge was put out in 16, well, it was 12 original researchers. The team became 16 guys who get a big pot of money, and they get access to resources. And, and they were told, here's your mission. And I, and I put it right there at the bottom. Your mission, like, we want to figure out how you can figure out how you can go listen to a, a, a language posed in natural language in English, a question, and how you can take that question and go off and use advanced data management and, and all of the new technologies we've got to postulate an answer with a degree of certainty or accuracy with all this information that's out there. And you've got to be able to do that without any help. You've got to build a system to do that. Well, they couldn't do that right away. But they, they got a lot of money and they got a chance to go off and try to figure out how do we build an artificial intelligence that could take a question posed by a human and figure out a way to answer it with a high degree of confidence from the data sources that are available to us today. Uh, so, they said there are three fundamental things you need to be able to accomplish. You need to be able to understand natural language. You need to be able to generate a hypothesis from an answer from that question that was posed to you. And ideally, you want to be able to learn. So you want to, if you've made a mistake, you want to be able to learn from that mistake and not repeat it. So you have to be a learning cognitive system. Very different than everything that had been built previously. The investments made, the research team stood up, they're off on this grand challenge to see if they can, they can build a computer solution that will do this. And, and the twist is that the CEO says, and by the way, we want this to, to all be able to be assistive, not replace humans, but it's, it's to augment the intelligence of humans. So as you design this, you've got to be able to think about what do humans do well, and what would artificial intelligence deliver to a computing environment do well. So they, so the researchers say, okay, well now we have to do a little bit of a project to figure out well, what do humans do well, and what don't we do well, and that, what are those core capabilities, those uh, characteristics that we want to have to come out of the, uh, the research that we did. So they, they, they looked at humans, and, and, and what we're really good at is we're really good at being able to have morals and, and common sense applied to, to our reasoning. And that's hard to put into a computing system. Um, by the way, the morals and common sense comes with biases. And those biases can, can actually cause you to think something different from the data that's presented. So, so we come with that little bit of a flaw too as humans. Um, but we have imagination, compassion, and, and, and other characteristics that were outlined here that, that you would say are, are characteristics that are really hard to build into an, an automated cognitive system that are great for a person. They said, okay, so now what do we need to augment all these great capabilities that we have as humans? We can definitely use technology to locate information and knowledge and, and mine that information faster than we can. So we can do that. Um, we know definitely that if we use cognitive systems, we eliminate the biases. They, they don't come with our preconceived filters that we uh, sometimes 
unknowingly apply as we're, as we're reasoning and looking at making certain decisions. Um, and we know that absolutely, uh, in a, in a, we've had history of it, that we can do great work with pattern matching. Uh, big foot images, we're going to talk about that. Uh, we know now with the, the new designs of our, of our programming languages and neural networks that we can actually have computer systems learn on their own. So that's great. Sometimes we don't learn. Some, sometimes we just, we're reluctant as humans to, to want to learn from an event. We're not excelled. We know that, again, that with those biases, if certain conditions are learned in a cognitive engine, they're accepted and adapted. Um, and, and then we as well know that we can do, at scale, the processing of large, large volumes of, um, of natural language um, data. Um, so that, let me turn that into English. Um, we know that we can now, in a cognitive system, this is what we need, have the ability to be able to read a lot of print, a lot, at a really, really high speed, and interpret it correctly. Our reading is limited to a number of pages per, per minute. The, the capabilities from a cognitive system are exponentially faster than what we're capable. So that ability to be able to take natural language text data and process it is huge. Um, and, and then we, we get tired as humans. Computers don't. Uh, they're machines. So, so we would have endless capability. You know, as large as the machines that you can build and the processing capability you can put into them, you would have that capacity to be doing that knowledge finding that, that is, you know, reading and, and image analysis activity, all of that would be done tirelessly through a machine technology. So we've got, you know, we've got the ability to be able to have continual analysis being performed. So some great outcomes, you know, that, that could be derived from cognitive systems, and this is what the research team was saying, okay, we have to build all these and have them somehow be able to interact with humans and be complementary. And that was the challenge that we set up. Doing that, there's there's three different layers I would t I would say, of cognitive computing that you evolve through as you're as you're doing the research and as you're building your systems. Um, there's a lot of players right now in the marketplace that have artificial intelligence in their solutions and their offerings, and, and that's it's simply you know an ability to be able to think like a human. Um, so a really good example is the, the, the checkers game the, or the, the chess game that you can you can play on your on your app or on your computer. Someone had to sit down and think about every possible move, and a, and a, and a computer analyst wrote an application. He wrote a program that thought about all those moves. And now if you do this, then it knows to do that. Um, that's great. It's the most basic of artificial intelligence capabilities that you could deliver into the market. Then you go to the next level, which is machine learning, and, and you say, well, you know, now I, I want to go another layer. I want to have a system that knows how to play chess, but it starts to see a certain pattern, and it knows if those moves happen, I should change my way I play with this partner that I'm playing against because I can predict what he's going to do. So that machine is actually learned and adjusted based on its experience. We couldn't do that. When I was a developer, and I graduated from a map and computer science, and I went into developing, absolutely no language, no computer language or capability existed. But today, with the neural networking programming solutions that are available to our application developers, they exist. It's, it's programs that rewrite themselves as they learn and no longer need a programmer. So that's the next layer is machine learning. It's amazing, it's, a, it's, a, it's open doors uh, for us in capabilities that we never thought we would have. Guys like me, who started in the industry in, in the early 80s. So that's your second level in, in having you now much smarter artificial intelligence. That's machine learning. And then deep learning, deep learning is your, you know, your your highest level of cognitive computing capabilities that you'll see on the market today. Um, Google, Google DeepMind comes to mind, and, and, and our IBM Watson offering are, are two of the larger um, providers in the marketplace. There aren't a lot of players that are there yet. It takes a tremendous amount of research and compute capacity to be able to de develop and deliver uh, the deep learning type solutions. But in those solutions, 
uh, what's a game changer there is now those solutions start to identify certain data sets, so certain information that, that the, the actual artificial intelligence, the, the cognitive computing solution, has determined would be extra invaluable in trying to solve something, and it goes out and finds sources of that extra data, finds those data sets, and then learns from those data sets, looks for patterns and correlations. So it's a, it's a huge extension now beyond the machine learning uh, component. And, and this is where we're really excited and we're placing a lot of bets inside of IBM on trying to drive that. And, and, you know, and there's, you know, there's certain analogies, but it's, it's trying to find, you know, can I, can I find correlations on certain health patterns that, that I can tie right back to a data set on weather? And, and gosh, you know, we just happen to figure out that there's certain barometric experiences that actually we can, we can with science, so that we have with efficacy, we can prove raises certain asthmatic occurrences. And, and, and now, you know, we've got an ability to be able to, because we've got all these sensors that give us weather data, start predicting when we're going to see asthmatic attacks rise in certain parts of the country or certain parts of the city. It's amazing what you can do if you start to learn how to be able to take all that data that's available to us and mix it all together and make some certain conclusions. So, with that said, I, um, I mentioned that we did the grand challenge. We sent those researchers out, we gave them a whole bunch of money, and we said, okay guys, go try to build a cognitive computing solution. And, and what they decided they were going to do is they said, well, you know what we'll do? We'll use Jeopardy as our example of the use case. So their use case in, in, in many medical sciences, health sciences, and in, in technology as well. So our use case will be, we're only we're only able to compete with a human if we can put the cognitive computing solution up against the two best players of Jeopardy. Because they're random questions, they, they, they come across, you know, they're, they're natural language, they're, they're English spoken, and you have a, a very limited amount of time, you know, to compete. So you've got, you've got to be rapid in forming, the, first, interpreting and understanding the question, then forming your hypothesis on what you think the answer is, and then try to figure out, okay, how do I score the probability of the different possible hypotheses that I have as the answer, and then present it. So this this will be a real test. Well, they failed. Um, they, they, they failed badly. <laughs> there were many examples where the, the, the computer was, uh, was getting the wrong answers and much too slow. And they refined it, and they refined it, and they refined it. Um, so that, that project where they got funding in 2006, kept on going until 2011. And in 2011, um, they had actually developed a uh, cognitive artificial intelligence solution that could play the game of Jeopardy. Um, and, and none of the developers are, have any awareness of what questions are going to be asked, and they can't do anything with the computer when the game is on. And, um, and they did well. So, wow. We, we, you know, we, we, we won a Jeopardy game, so what? <laughs> the CEO said that we wrote a big check to, to win a Jeopardy game. We, we got to do a lot more with that capability than just Jeopardy. So the uh, so the, the, the CEO for uh, for IBM said, you know what? One of the best places that, that we could have an effect in, in an area where IBM hasn't really been influential in the past is healthcare. So. How do we take now this cognitive computing capability, this ability to be able to like, interpret natural language questions and read information, search all of these assets that are out on the internet, and help form answers? How do we how do we take that to healthcare and, and, and do some things with it? And um, and then the leadership team came back and said, well, you know, you write another big check, and we'll and we'll create a whole business unit around taking that that capability into the healthcare marketplace. And, and we formed the Watson Healthcare Business Unit, um, and we subsequently spent seven billion dollars, and uh, about uh, seven thousand people dedicated to working on that. And then, and then after that was launched, the healthcare piece, and, and um, my CEO called that the moonshot. Um, 
we then said, okay, and all these assets, by the way, have great value in many, many different industries. You know, you, if you can predict the propensity for a certain um, marker from a certain marker for a disease, maybe you can also predict what might happen with a foreign exchange rate on a currency, or maybe you can predict might might happen with a certain commodity. So, of course, now after healthcare was started. People started to look at how do these technologies apply to the financial services industry, to the insurers that are out there, and, and on and on. So we started to look at how do we take that capability across many industries. But that that's kind of the evolution of, of where you know it evolved to. It started as a as a as a research grant challenge. Uh, it proved itself out. Once it proved itself out with a use case that really was was able to resonate and demonstrate what it can do. Then the technology was was purpose built to solve certain industry related solutions. Okay, so that's kind of the evolution that happened on us to building our our, our capabilities around cognitive computing inside of IBM. Yeah. So I've talked a lot about this, but I haven't explained how it works. And and we have these brilliant communications people that do a way better job than I do, <laughs> and have spent all kinds of money on building. Um, um, presentations and uh, videos that describe it. So I have a six minute, six and a half minute, I think, clip um, that, that talks about how it works. And it's great because pretty well everyone understands how we've described it through this video. They did a much better job than I would have in trying to describe how um, a cognitive system actually works. So I'll play this video for us. <laughs> IBM's Watson is at the forefront of a new era of computing, cognitive computing. It's a radically new kind of computing, very different from the programmable systems that preceded it, as different as those systems were from the tabulating machines of a century ago. Conventional computing solutions, based on mathematical principles that emanate from the 1940s, are programmed based on rules and logic intended to derive mathematically precise answers often following a rigid decision tree approach. But with today's wealth of big data and the need for more complex, evidence-based decisions, such a rigid approach often breaks or fails to keep up with available information. Cognitive computing enables people to create a profoundly new kind of value, finding answers and insights locked away in volumes of data. Whether we consider a doctor diagnosing a patient, a wealth manager advising a client on their retirement portfolio, or even a chef creating a new recipe, they need new approaches to put into context the volume of information they deal with on a daily basis in order to derive value from it. This process serves to enhance human expertise. Watson and its cognitive capabilities mirror some of the key cognitive elements of human expertise. Systems that reason about problems like a human does when we as humans seek to understand something and to make a decision, we go through four key steps. First, we observe visible phenomena and bodies of evidence. Second, we draw on what we know to interpret what we're seeing, to generate hypotheses about what it means. Third, we evaluate which hypotheses are right or wrong. Finally, we decide, choosing the option that seems best and acting accordingly. Just as humans become experts by going through the process of observation, evaluation, and decision-making, cognitive systems like Watson use similar processes to reason about the information they read. Watson can also do this at massive speed and scale. So how does Watson do it? Unlike conventional approaches to computing, which can only handle neatly organized structured data, such as what is stored in a database, Watson can understand unstructured data, which is 80% of data today, all of the information that is produced primarily by humans for other humans to consume. This includes everything from literature, articles, research reports, to blogs, posts, and tweets. While structured data is governed by well-defined fields that contain well-specified information, Watson relies on natural language which is governed by rules of grammar, context, and culture. It's implicit, ambiguous, complex, and a challenge to process. While all human language is difficult to parse, certain idioms can be particularly challenging. In English, for instance, we can feel blue because it's raining cats and dogs while we're filling in a form someone asked us to fill out. When it comes to text, Watson doesn't just look for keyword matches or synonyms like a search engine. It actually reads and interprets text like a person. It does this by breaking down a sentence grammatically, relationally, and structurally, discerning meaning from the semantics of the written material. Watson understands context. This is very different than simple speech recognition, which is how a computer translates human speech into a set of words. 
Watson tries to understand the real intent of the user's language and uses that understanding to possibly extract logical responses and draw inferences to potential answers through a broad array of linguistic models and algorithms. When Watson goes to work in a particular field, it learns the language, the jargon, and the mode of thought of that domain. Take the term cancer, for instance. There are many different types of cancer, and each type has different symptoms and treatment. However, those symptoms can also be associated with diseases other than cancer. Treatments can have side effects and affect people differently depending on many factors. Watson evaluates standard of care practices and thousands of pages of literature that capture the best science in the field. And from all of that, Watson identifies the therapies that offer the best choices for the doctor to consider in their treatment of the patient. With the guidance of human experts, Watson collects the knowledge required to have literacy in a particular domain, what's called a corpus of knowledge. Collecting a corpus starts with loading the relevant body of literature into Watson. Building the corpus also requires some human intervention to cull through the information and discard anything that is out of date, poorly regarded, or immaterial to the problem domain. We refer to this as curating the content. Next, the data is pre-processed by Watson, building indices and other metadata that make working with that content more efficient. This is known as ingestion. At this time, Watson may also create a knowledge graph to assist in answering more precise questions. Now that Watson has ingested the corpus, it needs to be trained by a human expert to learn how to interpret the information. To learn the best possible responses and acquire the ability to find patterns, Watson partners with experts who train it in using an approach called machine learning. An expert will upload training data into Watson in the form of question-answer pairs that serve as ground truth. This doesn't give Watson explicit answers for every question it will receive, but rather teaches it the linguistic patterns of meaning in the domain. Once Watson has been trained on QA pairs, it continues to learn through ongoing interaction. Interactions between users and Watson are periodically reviewed by experts and fed back into the system to help Watson better interpret information. Likewise, as new information is published, Watson is updated so that it's constantly adapting to shifts in knowledge and linguistic interpretation in any given field. Watson is now ready to respond to questions about highly complex situations and quickly provide a range of potential responses and recommendations that are backed by evidence. It's also prepared to identify new insights or patterns locked away in information. From metallurgists looking for new alloys to researchers looking to develop more effective drugs, human experts are using Watson to uncover new possibilities in data and make better evidence-based decisions. Across all of these different applications, there is a common approach that Watson follows. After identifying parts of speech in a question or inquiry, it generates hypotheses. Watson then looks for evidence to support or refute the hypotheses. It scores each passage based on statistical modeling for each piece of evidence, known as weighted evidence scores. Watson estimates its confidence based on how high the response is rated during evidence scoring and ranking. In essence, Watson is able to run analytics against a body of data to glean insights, which Watson can turn into inspirations, allowing human experts to make better and more informed decisions. Across an organization, Watson scales and democratizes expertise by servicing accurate responses and answers to an inquiry or question. Watson also accelerates expertise by surfacing a set of possibilities from a large body of data, saving valuable time. Today, Watson is revolutionizing the way we make decisions, become experts, and share expertise in fields as diverse as law, medicine, and even cooking. Further, Watson is discovering and offering answers and patterns we hadn't known existed faster than any person or group of people ever could, in ways that make a material difference every day. Most important of all, Watson learns, adapts, and keeps getting smarter. It actually gains value with age by learning from its interactions with us and from its own successes and failures, just like we do. So, now that you know how it works, how do these ideas inspire how you work? How can Watson make you a better expert? What will you do with Watson? So we, we've we got now something that has this great cognitive capability, and as we heard, and it needs to learn about its specific industry application. So we sent, we sent Watson to school. We sent Watson to medical school. Um, Watson read all the literature. Everything in PubMed, 
it, it, all of the research articles and publications that are used in any of the major databases and uh, repositories globally. Um, we then picked certain um, practitioners that we wanted to work with, centers of excellence. Uh, so we went, for example, to Memorial Sloan Kettering and spent two years for the internship. I'm going to call it an internship. So, so, so now Watson has all this great generally available data. It's read every textbook that would be used by a, a doctor or a practitioner that was going through training. Uh, so it has all that, but it doesn't have the, the real human practical experience. So you heard about those question answer pairs that are used to train. So Memorial Sloan Kettering, uh, uh, one of the large, uh, well-recognized cancer centers in the US, was our partner for the training around oncology. So we spent two years uh, with the practitioners there uh, taking actual real pathology and, and real clinical results from patients that were going through treatment there and feeding that data into Watson, seeing what Watson would conclude on both the diagnosis and the treatment pro uh, protocol recommendation. And those doctors reviewed that material in training and said, no, you're wrong, yeah, you're right, no, you're wrong, yeah, you're right. And, and you build this ground truth capability to the point where now the machine learning has enough that it can now be self-sufficient. So after two years, Watson graduated from medical school, is what we would say. Uh, so you've got you know, a, now a system that, that you know, it, it understands natural language and it understands the lexicon or the, the, um, the specialty that it's been trained in. And then imagine, you know, after you've done that, you can then do it for financial services. You can then do that for, you know, if you want to go into um, engineering, so oceanography, you can go into what we did around weather. Um, so we built a specialty capability around medical sciences. And then um, we, we, we made available to the practitioners now um, this cognitive capability to help assist them in delivering their services in the healthcare industry. Um, we have Watson now able to generate and evaluate continually any of the new data and research that comes out. Um, we have it learning uh, and adapting based on the feedback it's getting from all of the locations that um, I now leverage and use and put data back in from their activities and results. And you have um, Watson now position to be able to complement the services provided by our, our physicians and our practitioners and be able to build trust with those practitioners because as humans work with computers, the, one of the big problems that you, you do experience is the willingness to be able to accept some of the information that's being presented from you know, this, this computing entity. So the building trust component on the slide happens by showing what's the evidence behind the conclusion or recommendation that's been made by the cognitive system and pointing to the specific items and then giving a probability weighted index around why it believes that that's the right answer. And if you do that often enough, then the confidence of the recipient of that information goes up. You, 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 you tend to say, okay, now I can investigate it if I want, but I can see how this, this recommendation was derived, and I have a lot more trust and confidence in it. So we, we, we built a solution that, um, that can do that. All right. So, I told you to say, okay, so when, when do you actually make that real? So let me talk now about a few um, real applications. Let's go test it. Let's take it for a test drive. So we went to University of North Carolina, and we uh, we worked with uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Ned Sharpless, uh, Norman Sharpless. And yeah. Dr. Sharpless uh, is the head of the oncology board at um, at University of North Carolina where, uh, at the Cancer Center. And I don't know for those of you that don't know the process uh, for for uh, the oncology department. They, they they'll meet in the boardroom every week with their toughest cases. And they'll do a peer review of all of the data and information available on that patient. And then they'll consult with each other to make conclusions around a diagnosis or conclusions around a treatment protocol. That's, that's the practice. And um, so you get the, the, the depth and the experience and the talent of the group of oncologists that are the specialists in that, uh, in that hospital, that care center. So we say, let's go take a thousand cases that you did previously. We're going to do a retrospective analysis. We're going to take a thousand of the patients from the past 
And we want to we want to feed all the information that, that you guys had, all the clinical uh, data. So the clinical notes we want to have any of the blood work, any of the pathology reports, any of the image data, all of that data that you guys would look at when you got in that boardroom. And we want to feed it into Watson, and we want to see what the Watson and oncology advisor would come back with. We want to see how it does on. It's, its um, ability to be able to do a diagnosis, and we want to see you know, how it does on its ability to be able to uh, have a treatment protocol recommended. So they did that, and then they and then they came back and they said um, they said, "Wow, you know, like this is great. We uh, we, we ran the results in uh, at 98 percent, 98 percent of the um, of the recommendations on the on the diagnosis from from Watson um, were accurate." We're the same, I shouldn't say accurate, we're the same as uh, the, the conclusions that have been made by the oncology team uh, under Dr. Uh, Dr. Sharpless. So he said, it, it, what do you think of that? Isn't that great? Like, we actually had the computer get 98% accuracy on, on its determinant of the, uh, the cancer. And Dr. Sharpless said, that's not what impresses me. He says, like, I'm, I'm happy that my team did that well. <laughs> he says, <laughs> but he said, what really, really impressed me, he said, was the treatments, because of the thousand patients, 300 treatment recommendations were made by Watson that we hadn't even thought of, that we hadn't seen. He said, 30 percent, and they had relevance. Like they, they were actually, had we known about them something, we would have investigated for that patient back when they were coming through our treatment. He said, that's what's amazing to me. And Dr. Sharpless said, you know, we don't have sufficient time to be reading all of the literature on everything that's happening. And on a number of those, those 30% that, that had other alternative treatment recommendations, it was a recent study that had good credibility indexes. So, so when we score the credibility, so it was a study performed by an institution that scored high in, in the confidence factor with certain researchers that scored high in the confidence factors. So we had some really relevant things that we could have been investigating that might have changed the treatment we recommended. And we could never do that without the assistance of a cognitive engine like that. I mean, we need that artificial intelligence to be scanning all the research and all of the information available to help us as a clinical assistant to us when we sit down and we say, okay, what's the best thing we can do for this patient? So Dr. Dr. Um, Sharpless said he was actually he was quite pleased with the outcomes from the work, and he, he agreed to go on CBC and uh, do 60 minutes. CBS, I should say. So, um, so there's a there's an interview with uh, Dr. Sharples on uh, on their website at uh, 60 Minutes that has him talking about this. But this is this is the stuff that excited me on, you know, how we might be able to affect change in the future as it, you know adoption gets greater and greater, and as our machine learning grows more and more, it gets smarter. And it'll be able to increase the confidence levels. It'll be able to find other correlations and patterns of potential treatments for oncology patients that our practitioners, our, our specialists, wouldn't have the time and the ability to get to. It's going to assist them in making more informed decisions. So that was one of the great illustrations of the outcome from the work that had been done on, on sending Watson off to medical school. So the other, the other thing we found is that um, it takes a tremendous amount of time to actually get a drug to market. Uh, for those of you that, that, that um, have ever worked in, in, in research and life sciences, that had any affiliation with the pharmaceutical companies, uh, you, you, in, in, in just general reading, you, you know it, it takes hundreds of millions of dollars for a drug to actually be you know, researched, identified, and then go through clinical trials and be accepted. And, you know, and a material part of that is testing that drug's effect on people. You, know, you have to know, are there going to be adverse reactions, in language terms, adverse reactions to that drug. But what we don't have, is a, didn't have, was a good way to be able to look at all the research that's been done and figure out, are there some drugs that are already out there that have certain effects that we use for treatment 
that um, can be metabolized, that, that, that don't present a problem for consumption and use as a treatment, that may have other purposes beyond what was originally intended. And, and so we said, well, maybe what we can do is we can use artificial intelligence and the deep learning that we have in, in the Watson engine and, and start to build ways to help researchers look at the possibility to use drugs for more than just the original treatment. So we went out, we did, an, we did a test, we did an experiment, and um, we looked at certain proteins as the first test, and, um, and, and that's the little piece there that on a retrospective analysis, again, we went back and looked at historical, we took data that had been available, uh, lim the limited data that had been available to researchers and asked the, the cognitive system to go see what it would conclude, and sure enough, it, went out, it found seven of the nine known um, T53 uh, kinases proteins, uh, but that wasn't the important thing. As, again, back to Dr. Sharpless, what was really important is it found an additional six candidates from that exercise that the researchers hadn't found. So then they were excited, they're like, oh, this is great, now we're going to go off, we're going to start to do some research on these other six proteins, because apparently they have effect. So they are of value to us in our research. So we, we learned from that experience, and, and, and now the Watson for Drug Discovery solution is, is out and available, and we're actually here locally here in Canada. We're working with the Ontario Brain Institute, and we're working with um, the CNET on uh, looking at some ways that we can help with the research that's ongoing right now around Parkinson's and uh, some of the research that's going, around, uh, going on around uh, cardiac arrhythmia. So some, some other great you know, outcomes of applying the technology into real world um, solutions that we need to develop. Now, if I bring it even closer to home, we have this ability to be able to take all kinds of data now with great you know, ca computing capacity and using artificial intelligence, look at all that data and look for signals or patterns or correlations that we might not normally recognize and detect whether or not those patterns mean something. So we now have the ability with, uh, with smart blankets, they call it uh, data baby, uh, at sick kids we have blankets that lay over top of the neonatal children that are um, under care and it monitors all of their vital signs, so the vital signs will be their respiratory rate, their temperature, their heartbeat, um, and, it, and it looks for patterns, keeps all that data and when events happen we can build a correlation around those vitals that we were monitoring and now start to be predictive. So what does that mean? Um, well, over at Hamilton Health Sciences, for example, they came up with the Hue score. Um, the Hue score was a score that said, we know that certain people will start to present problems that we could detect before they're about to have a really critical event. And the better we can do at figuring out what are, what are those little things that they present ahead of time, and what's the pattern that tells me that in one day, two days, two hours, four hours, a critical event's going to happen. Because if we could solve how we collect all that data and analyze it and determine the pattern early enough, we can eliminate the critical event. So a code blue, all of us hate hearing that in the hospital, code blue is a code blue is a, is a rescue. A rescue is that's where you see the specialty team with the crash cart heading to a room because someone is in a cardiac arrest or respiratory arrest. Um, and over at Hamilton Health Sciences, they, they were actually able to take the code blues down to next to zero by having this early warning capability. And it was continuous monitoring of the vitals of certain patients. And then having a, a, an ability to be able, when they saw a trend, a pattern in those vitals, very quickly get to the bedside and be proactive in being able to provide treatment and versus reactive and having to provide that treatment after it's later in the event. So some great things happening there around the, the, the combination of you know, compute capacity and being able to take so much data streaming in, but then be able to use the artificial intelligence to put some smarts around what all that data tells you, and then to have a notification process to let practitioners know, to inform them that there's something happening. So everybody knows, and I, and I shared earlier about the uh, the number of um, diagnostic images that we have, right? Um, and, and in today's model, we rely on a diagnostic radiologist to uh, to, to read all those images, and, and it's a really tough job uh, to do because you, you have to look at so many different layers of an image, and you, you're trying to look for that little tiny speck that you think is an anomaly in the images that could be a lesion. Um, 
And we know that it's, it's inefficient, it's very taxing on the practitioners. Um, there's a tremendous amount of time that's wasted in the productivity as well. And, and interpretation between different uh, diagnostic radiologists can be different. You know, it, it, someone may see something that someone else doesn't. So um, there's a you know, huge dependency on, on the, the accuracy, quality, and the experience of the, um, the diagnostic radiologist. So some, some work was done looking at the imaging market. They said, you know, okay, there's, there's lots of ways we can affect improvement in the health and the care, improvement in the value that we get from uh, delivering diagnostic radiology um, 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 results and analysis. And, uh, and as well, we can do something, I think, for the doctors. So, so again, you know, with this ability to be able to learn, imagine if you can, if you can take Imagine if you can take a hundred thousand images and in every one of those you know that there's a lesion. And then you can take a hundred thousand other images and in all those you know that they're fine. If you feed those into a machine learning cognitive engine or cognitive system, you can teach that computer to be able to read those, those diagnostic images and make those determinations. So you could over time, if you chose, have it where when a diagnostic radiologist is looking at an image, there's an artificial intelligence capability saying, by the way, you probably should look right here in this quadrant, because I think there might be something there. Matter of fact, you could have it where every image that's taken by the, by the imaging department goes through some analysis that's done by a cognitive computer first, and it points out the top 10 that it's most concerned with. And those are the ones that get to the diagnostic radiologist at the beginning of their day versus later in the day. That's happening today. Absolutely, we want our diagnostic radiologist to have this assistance because we're not going to get rid of diagnostic radiologists. We saw the volume of imaging that we're creating. We need to give them tools to be more productive, more effective. We need to help them with their accuracy and the prioritization of the work that they do. And, and those capabilities are here today. We're, we're, we're doing that now. We're refining it. We're getting it better and better every day. We have uh, an, an image collaborative inside of IBM that was built. Uh, it, it, it has a combination of uh, um, research and, and uh, academic representatives. It has a private sector from the guys who make the big imaging machines. Um, and it has, as well, the um, the doctors themselves, the radiologists themselves participating. Uh, we're focused on, on brain, we're focused on, on breast, specifically around breast cancer. Um, we're on heart and, uh, and colon and lung. Um, and I'm delighted to say that there, in, in Canada there's one party that is a participant in the, um, in the imaging collaborative with the global, worldwide imaging collaborative that IBM has. And that's uh, Dr. Anvari, who uh, Mayor Anvari, who's over at the uh, Center for Surgical um, Invention and Innovation, and uh, he sits on uh, on that board and uh, has influence and participates specifically around his interest in, in trying to better better diagnose um, breast tumors uh, and early diagnosis of breast cancer lesions. So great work being done there and on applying this machine learning capability, and it, it, it you know it can it doesn't get tired. Doesn't have a bad day, doesn't get sick. It can be reading images every single second. Right? So we've got we've got some great capabilities that are gonna, that are gonna present themselves over time around um, changes in how we improve the uh, the um, imaging scan, uh, scans and analysis. We also looked at how do you take a bunch of data that already exists today and, and be better at, at analyzing it. Uh, in, in the hospitals, every time we go into uh, the hospital. Uh, there's an electronic health record, EHR system, that, that every hospital will use. And in that system, they capture everything about us. And so they'll have the handwritten notes, the clinical notes from the doctors are scanned in. All of our, all of our lab results are in there. All of our vital sign information, everything about us, and all our phenotypical data. So that, everything about your height, your weight, and everything about you is all in those EHRs. Doctors and practitioners can't go into that EHR and, and read all of that all the time. It, it'd be really tough for them to be able to uh, take all that information. Again, another perfect fit for how you can take artificial intelligence and cognitive computing and have it on behalf of the practitioner be able to 
look at all that data and make some intelligent um, decisions about it. So we did a bunch of work there, and, um, and sure enough, we found that there's, there's markers and there's data that's inside your health record that would allow us to be able to have a prediction about your propensity, your probability of having heart failure, and be able to then start to treat you ahead of time before we have an event happen. And without the capabilities of cognitive computing, that wouldn't have been able to be possible. Patient engagement, I talked about how that, that handset that sort of really changed things for us with that smartphone. Um, the smartphones are really going to be transformational, not just on being able to collect data and present data, but uh, as well to be able to share some certain information that's important for the, uh, for the patient as well, be it uh, medical data, uh, you know, information around you know, taking your meds, we're really starting to leverage the technologies differently. And artificial intelligence can be used to be able to, to monitor adherence to certain protocols and then provide you with a consultation around your use of it. Um, and also, as I mentioned, it can be used as a, uh, as a way to be able to collect data. Okay, I'm going to finish with, um, with some commentary from a, uh, a local Ontario researcher that, uh, that did some work with uh, some of our, our technology capabilities. This is a scan of the brain at work. Using the IBM Cloud and IBM technology, we've built a program that allows us to analyze the brain in real time. We're beginning to be able to diagnose network disorders like autism, schizophrenia, and Alzheimer's. Our program identifies each region of the brain with a circle, and then we connect these circles with lines so that we can see regions of the brain communicating. This can tell us which areas are working hard and which areas are under-functioning. In the past, a scientist would work really hard to gather a relatively small amount of data. Now we can gather enormous amounts of data, but the sheer volume means that we can no longer use our old analytical tools. The new tools we've developed have accelerated our work by an order of magnitude. Now we can do adaptive testing to activate and see different parts of the brain and get the results in real time. So something that took multiple visits now takes milliseconds. Neuroimaging is expensive, but we're making it more affordable by reducing the number of scans and getting results much faster. And that means less anxiety for the patient. I love the idea of being able to quantify neuropsychiatric illness. If I can provide data that helps patients legitimize their illness, and helps people understand that these are real brain disorders, I feel good about that. Alright, so I, I hope I've convinced you that um, artificial intelligence and cognitive computing isn't something we need to be afraid of, but it's something that we, we absolutely need to um, embrace. And that together, humans and our cognitive partners in technology, I think, are going to uh, continue to have a huge influence on, on what we see in healthcare services and medical services that are provided in, in the near term and uh, without question in the long term. Again, I thank you. Uh, I was delighted to have the opportunity to be here.